Hello and welcome to your go-to Detroit Pistons podcast, The Pistons Pulse, co-hosted by me, Bryce Simon of Motor City Hoops, a former D1 Hooper and current teacher, husband, and father of three amazing kids. And I'm Amari Sanko for the second Pistons beat writer for the Detroit Free Press. Amari? Well, hold up. Sorry, Wes. Shout out to Wes, our producer. Shout we out always, to Wes. We always got to give him some love as well. So I just, I wanted to get to the end of this season so quickly. I was going to miss over and skip over the most important part. So my apologies, Wes. I wanted to get right into the fact that Amari, 82 games of Detroit Pistons basketball is over for the 2023-2024 NBA season. Yeah, it's over. It's weird. It's like the first three-fourths of the season. It's like the third year in a row it went this way. The first three-fourths go by quick, and it's like March, and it's like, wow, that went by quick. And then the last four or five weeks just take just as long as the previous four months. This happens every single year. It would probably be different if it were, you know, a team that has momentum building as the season goes, like, Milwaukee, well, I guess they don't have momentum building. They actually have the opposite since they've been struggling. <laughs> but like a team that still has intrigue yeah. going down the stretch, but when they kind of shut everybody down, it just, you start to put the clock ticket after a certain point. Cause it also helps us because now we can talk about the big things, the feature of the organization and all the stuff that they have to deal with this offseason after such a real year. And that's what makes it tough too, because you, you want to, you have to wait to really talk about the real stuff people want to talk about. So we're on the other side now and it feels good. Well, and what's hard, Amari, and I find myself already thinking about this is people are going to question every move and and probably rightfully so, but everything's going to be quick. And I think people's excitement is going to be tempered because we've allowed ourselves to get excited about the moves last offseason and the offseason before and the draft the year, you know, all of these things. And now it's like, even if they draft the player that everybody wants, and that's the thing. There's no way everybody's going to agree on the draft this year. Like we thought there was, you know, discussion last season around the number five overall pick. It doesn't matter what pick the Pistons get this year. It could be number one and there's going to be all sorts of thoughts and opinions and and, uh, nobody's wrong. I'm just saying like it's going to be hard to get too excited because it's like, okay, how is this? You know, as Aruna says here, finally, the end of this awful, awful season where everything that could go wrong did. And that's kind of how you feel about things with this organization right now is even if they take one step forward, okay, where are the two steps back coming? You know, like there's just this bad juju around all of it. So I'm excited for the offseason, Omari, to give us something to talk about with a little more energy and enthusiasm. And it's going to be interesting, if nothing else, right? There's a lot to discuss and there's a lot of things that could happen. But I'm going into it a little bit cautious because I know that it, it just it, it's a big one and, and things need to be done right. Yeah, it feels like we're in the exact same place we were a year ago, except instead it's more so like the front office element instead of the coach element. Obviously, the Pistons are looking for a president of basketball operations. I wrote about it Sunday and then they formalized it late last night around 930. And that's, you know, again, like it's going to be a reset to a certain extent because like you're not firing anybody right now. You're not firing Troy Weaver. You're not firing Monty Williams, but you are putting a new person in charge. And this person's been our final say over everything in the organization. And they essentially come in and assume power. So at some point, does that become a full front office reset? You know, do people continue to some capacity and just get reassigned in new roles? I think there's a lot that's going to be worked out, but that's, That's the big topic right now, right? Who do they go after? They're tapping a search firm to kind of guide this process for them. And they they want to move quick. So we'll just have to see how quick they can get it done and just who fits the mode of what they're looking for now that you're kind of moving on from this previous era to some extent. Yeah. And so anybody watching live with us, you know, get your thoughts, your opinions, your comments, your questions in the chat of all the episodes. Like this isn't a mailbag episode. But the the outline is very open and free for this end of the season, kick off the off season episode. Coming next week, we'll probably be like, hey, we're going to come in and we're going to talk draft or we're going to talk free agents or whatever. Really, it's like, hey, they've announced this search for a new president of basketball operations, uh, a pobo. Is that what we're going to, what, what do we call in this? A uh, pobo. Pobo doesn't, pobo doesn't, doesn't roll right. off the tongue. Like, I don't like it. Whenever I was director of basketball operations at American the year after I graduated, people called me the Dobo. And I was like, I hate this. Like, please nah. stop calling. Like, I feel like a fool being called that. The um, Dobo. So I, I don't like Pobo either. So, but we're going to talk about that. We may talk about some of the quotes from the player interviews on Monday, but again, very loose outline. 
And, you know, again, if you have comments, if you want to steer the conversation somewhere, Aruna says head of basketball operations. So a hobo. So, yeah, I I just. (laughs) That's a bad joke, but that's a good one. (laughs) So uh, Wes says Peebo. So I guess we're taking out the of like, I I, I don't know. I don't I don't like any of these, but I I guess let's just go ahead and, and go there, Amari. What does this mean for the organization? I know a lot of it was made. Like my phone started blowing up with the Woj bomb or whatever about Troy Weaver. Just give us, can you set the stage for everybody, Omari? I know you wrote an article, so make sure you go read Omari's article on this. What, what is this? What does it mean? Well, what can we kind of expect over the next couple of weeks until this person is hired and then maybe whoever that person is, what their role will be and kind of how this may look? I know you don't have all the answers, but just set the foundation. No doubt. So more or less, you're in year four of a rebuild. Obviously, if you have a season like the one you have, in a lot of instances, you just move on from the current core, right? And I think this is the first step to some extent to doing that, where you bring in just an entirely new voice, a president of basketball operations, which I mean, sure, it's a a, a title and you could say, well, you could give anybody a title, but I'm as power what they really have at the end of the day, because I think that's what they realized with this regime was that I mean, Troy may call it a lot of the shots, of, of course, but you, I think as you go deeper into the process and more uncertainty builds, you know, now, you know, Tom's <laughs> having more input and now ours having more input, you know, and then you can start to see those ideals clash. Uh, you like, you know, for example, going and getting Monty Williams last year, if it were up to, if it were fully up to, you know, like Monty said, no. Uh, so he, we're not going to go back and turn that, that page. I don't know how different things would be now, to be fair, because you're still dealing with the same roster, but that's just an example of, you know, how the general man- manager probably did not have all the power in that scenario where the owner said, no, we can make this happen, right? Like, I'm just going to sign a really, really big check. So you bring in a like somebody else, like elite single caller, somebody who you probably trust a bit more to turn this thing around. And, you know, then from there, a, a lot of the, the, of the decisions come down to them, right? You're empowering this person. So what does that mean for the coach? What does that mean for a trade general manager to trade take a different role or what does that mean because this person is going to operate with overhead over trade so there's a lot of questions i think will be answered as we get deeper into it but long story short the hiring of president of basketball operations this would be the new the person in charge and it's essentially a soft reset for uh this uh, new era that they're trying to overturn and obviously get this thing on the right track and so i, I don't want to ask you to repeat yourself with something you said multiple times. But I think what you said at the end there is important. It is your feel and understanding that this person will kind of have the control over a lot of the decisions moving forward. Yeah, that's my understanding. And the key to that is to hire the person in that role and then also stick to that, right? Uh, so we'll see how things play out. But I think there's an awareness that they probably need to be aligned in a, a, a sharper direction. And obviously you need somebody fresh to come in and, get a fresh pair of eyes on this thing and figure out what needs to be done. Uh, so that's where they're at now. And again, they want to move quick. So maybe in a couple of, a couple episodes, we'll have some more substantial updates here. This is an interesting question. I think you said there was an outside, but Dax Hoops uh, from YouTube said, do you know who is leading the interviewing process beside Tom Gore? So I think maybe you mentioned, maybe there was an outside company gathering, you know, the the candidates. And then I don't know if you have any intel beyond that. Yeah, no, I know that they're going to tap a search firm, and I think that's been pretty standard for a lot of NBA teams now when they go on these types of things. Uh, so that's where they're at now. Of course, it's going to be Tom's decision, like he's the one in, in charge. But, you know, of course, he has his general counsel and other people that he leans on for support, too. So I think it'll be pretty similar to uh, the process they went through with Troy a few years ago, right? That you just you have a list of candidates who bring them in and then you just select the right person. Big Dog Pissin says soft reset. Ugh, uh, I, I understand that, Big Dog. My, my thing is, though, I think it is important for this organization to take a step back and really figure out where are we at, who do we believe in, who are we going to hitch this thing to, and how do we move it forward? Wes and I talk about this all the time, Amari, is like as frustrating as all of this has been, there is a path forward for this organization. There's a lot of cap space, and I understand that that's like, a word that the fan base doesn't want to hear. I get it. But there is flexibility with the cap. There is young talent, including a Cade Cunningham, who is a very, very good. And then what is a SAR? What is Ivy? What is Duran? You know, all of these other guys, how do they fit with Cade? Is this the right coach? Is it not? Is it the right GM? Is it not? There's 
you know, uh, another draft pick. There's free, all of these things, Omari. There is a path to this working. Now, I think they put themselves in a position where the margin for error is a lot smaller than you would want for a team that's three, four years into this thing. But I think a soft reset, it doesn't mean a step back. It means we need to calculate where we're at, figure out what the path forward is, because that may look different than what we thought it was three or four years ago. No doubt. I mean, clearly something got messed up along the way here. We were just talking to players yesterday and none of them could really pinpoint exactly why things went wrong. They just know that they did, right? So if you have a scenario where maybe there's not finger pointing, but there's also a collective sense of what the heck just happened. At that point, you have to go, I think, to the outside and just, you know, come to the understanding that whatever stew you were making, like something went sour, like some, something went sour and you just got, got, got to toss some of it out. So, you know, again, I think Tom mentioned we're going to add, we're going to delete uh, something along those lines in December. And it's just going to be a process, I think, that plays out over a certain amount of time. My question is, Omar, do you think it is somebody outside the organization? Because... Or let me ask you this. Do you think it should be? Like, I'm asking you an opinion question from you now, not necessarily like, hey, what's your vibe or whatever. To me, I, I absolutely want this to be somebody that is currently outside the organization. Like, I don't want it to be a promotion. Like, I want somebody completely out, almost outside of the circle of Gores or Tellum or Troy, like anybody. I want somebody with fresh eyes, unbiased eyes that didn't draft Jaden Ivey, that didn't sign, you know, whoever. Make, I want somebody to come in and evaluate this roster and say, okay, we're starting with Cade Cunningham. Does Jaden Ivey work with Cade Cunningham? Yes? Okay, let's move from there. No? All right. How can we move on from him? Does that mean he comes off the bench? Does that mean we trade him? Does the SAR work with Cade? Yes? Perfect. Does Dirt, you know, like, and just do that from an outside perspective where there's no like, well, I selected him number five overall or I traded this to get him, like some of those things. So do you think, from your opinion, do you think an outside perspective is what's best? I think you have to bring outside eyes and get a, a fresh look at what you've you've built here, especially if the overarching goal is to get everybody on the same page. You know, like I think in order to do that, either you have people shift philosophy and take a step back or you just bring in people who just more so fit what you're looking for to begin with. It's kind of like when you hire a new coach and, you know, the coach usually brings in their own assistance, right? Because you want to hire people who are aligned with you from the jump. You know, you don't necessarily want any competing agendas in that scenario. So, I mean, you hire a search for them. That almost certainly points to you going to the outside and looking around and seeing what's out there. Uh, and overall, like my guess is that that's the direction that they'll go. Again, guys, anybody watching live, Twitter, YouTube, whatever, put a comment, put a question, whatever. You guys can help kind of drive today's episode as we kind of transition from the end of the regular season into the offseason. We'll, we'll have Keith Smith on, I'm sure, at some point to talk about the offseason. I had a cap question the other day. I feel pretty confident I can answer all of your NBA draft questions. I've been pretty hot and heavy with that, but we'll bring on hopefully Sam Bassini and some other people as well. I want to ask this, Omari, like, he, here's the thing. I have no idea who a good hire is going to be because I think it's so hard to really know who had their hands in what when it comes to front office decisions and what decision did they make? Like, so are there names you can float out there that you feel comfortable throwing out there? Like Big Dog Pistons here says someone from the Heat, the Grizz, the Nuggets. I've had people say they want somebody young with, you know, fresh ideas. Anything you can quote unquote report or have written in your articles that everybody should go read on the free press or, you know, just in general, anything you can kind of add? I don't have a long list of candidates now. I know that the John Horst name has been out there. And, you know, like my sense is that the Pistons, like that report came out. When I wrote this today, I think that's going to come out either tonight or uh, tomorrow morning. We're recording this on, on, on Tuesday. My sense is that when that report came out, the Pistons had not even truly had a list presented to them by a, a search firm yet, right? Like they're still pretty early in the process. But I think just reading between the lines there, you could see that, of course, has been with Milwaukee for a certain amount of time. And, you know, of course, since they made that coaching change, they've really struggled. You know, I think they closed the season with a losing record, actually, or right after they made that coaching change. Not a losing record overall. I think they have 49 wins, but just from that date. And, you know, at, at some point, a lot of front offices get shaken up, right? If you get to the points where you feel like you stagnated. But he has some ties here. So I think that's, like, I think you can connect the dots there. And I think that that's somebody that fits the mode of, who the Pistons kind of want in a row. But I think the main question for me is because you are bringing in somebody who's going to have oversight over the currently standing GM, does that mean you go for somebody who's 
probably had a more senior position. Like, do you just wait for a guy like a horse who's kind of been in that chair already and uh, kind of already comes in with that vision and that authority? Or do you go for maybe a more risky outside hire? I mean, you know, of course, you mentioned, you know, Denver, there are assistant GMs around the league. You could tap and lead this thing as well. So I think they'll have a pretty thorough search. We'll probably see a mix of candidates from both. One name I want to ask about, Dwayne Casey. Like, it was honestly a name that I thought of whenever this all came up. Now, this wouldn't fit the mold of what we're talking about because, again, like, Dwayne Casey has coached some of these guys. So there's going to be some perspective that, like, sure, it's good that he has that perspective, but there may be a little bit of built-in biases or, or whatever. Like, I'm not saying that in a negative way, but you know what I mean? So is Dwayne Casey, you know, potential? Like, we've seen him at games. I know, like, what he's been scouting or something like that. We know he's been a member of the front office. Well, I guess, can you give the the listeners an idea of what his role is currently, if you can, and then maybe if he's involved in this at all? Yeah, I mean, he's done a lot of scouting, like general counsel. Of course, he's somebody who's been coaching for a long time. Was out of great relationships around the league that you could leverage. You know, he's somebody who's had input in like roster decisions in the uh, past. So, of course, I think promoting him to the front office was just more of a formalization of that. I don't. I mean, I truly don't know. You know, the Wayne has personal interest in the job or not. Uh, but I would say you look at what Boston did with Brad Stevens. You know, I don't think the concept of promoting a coach to the front office is that wild. You know, I think especially somebody like Dwayne, who, again, has really close relationships across the league, you know, coaching or GM or front front office wise. You know, somebody who's been in the talent development game for a long time, for has been in the league for a long time. I think the logic makes sense. Like, I don't think that's an outlandish concept. But I personally don't know if Dwayne has interest in that job or not. So I'm not going to speak on behalf of him yet. So Jim V from Twitter says, what do Stefanski and Tellum's role? So can you kind of elaborate or maybe what, like, are they part of just like a team that's advising Tom Gores? Are they advising Troy Weaver? Are they kind of on yeah. the same What's your understanding with those guys? Yeah, I mean, Arne Tellum's the vice chairman. He has his hands all over the business side. And then, of course, he, you know, of course, is like one of the most well-known agents of all time. So I think naturally you went on his opinion for basketball council as well. And, you know, I don't know if it's ever going to be a situation where it's like Arn has no input at all. I think in any front office, you, you know, gather everybody's opinions and whatnot. I think it's just more so, you know, you're hiring the president of basketball apps to kind of be the, the, the end all be all as far as that. So it's just a little bit of a road change probably compared to the road Troy was hired into. But Stefanski, I think his role like he's somebody the fan base ask about a lot. He really does not have a significant say in the role of the organization. Like he's you know, still, of course, with the, the organization. He's not really involved in the day to day process to the extent that people think, you know, if we're talking people who do have that type of say, they have an assistant general manager, George David. You know, he's been with the organization in the, the past as well. He's worked in the agency side, you know, like he's somebody who's been part of this process too, but Stefanski has not had uh, a role in this at all. Like if you're listing the names of people who have, like he's like, he has not had that same level of input. That's just the best way I could put it. <laughs> Sorry. I started smiling because the little yeah. man joined us and was in the background. So yeah, you can go now. So, all right. Sorry, as the door slams behind. I want to ask one thing here as we got into this. So Jonathan Schwartz asks, are we sure this might not be a step back? Like why hire someone to develop a completely new vision? What if they decide the rebuild is broken? They need to reboot again. I understand the worry. I don't think it's that though, Amari. Like to me, it's not a take a step back and completely start over. I think it's take what they have now and find the right vision to move it forward, which, like you said, it's almost like where we were last offseason. It's a lot of the same pieces or ideas, you know, centered around Cade Cunningham. How do we take what we have now and move this thing forward? So I understand the worry of you're bringing in somebody new. What if they don't like any of the pieces? I don't think that's going to be the case. I think it's how do these pieces fit together? What pieces do we need to add around them to truly start moving this forward? when we all thought that was going to happen last off season and it just did not. I'm, I'm honestly not sure what a step back would even look like in this scenario. They just won 14 games. Like this is the worst Pistons team in franchise history. Worst team in the NBA for the second year in a row. There were teams that like came into the season they, like expecting to lose that one more games that the Pistons did. So I'm just, I don't think you, there's anything you could do that could make the, the team in a worse standing than it already is. But you come into a, a situation where you have Cade Cunningham, who's a clear building block. You have uh, some other recent draft picks you've built around him. 
you have 60 million in cap space and you have a top five pick. So there's a lot of resources you could tap into right now to change things pretty quickly. But yeah, as far as that, I think any direction is probably going to, I mean, I just don't see any, any direction that could be worse than <laughs> like where the team is now. Like, there's just no way you can sugarcoat 14 wins. Like, I, I really don't think there's any room they can go for them to get worse from here. All right, we're going to go to a short break. When we come back, Omari, it's your world. We got like six, seven starred questions and comments. You can cycle through those during the break. We can talk about some quotes you got from Monday during the player interviews. Like I said, we're kind of free flowing here on this week's episode of the Pistons Poll. So we'll go to a short break. When we come back, we'll let you take over and we'll rock from there. All right, we are back with segment two, and we're getting some 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 questions. We'll just dive into some of these here. First off, we do have a, a player question. What's yeah, I like this one. Person? Should we look for what is an ideal compliment for Cade Cunningham? Honestly, I just look around the league, and like you do have teams that have two, I guess, on bar creators, but very rarely are both of those guys guards. Right? Usually have like a wing, or it, a lot of times with the best teams, now a center who's also handling some of those responsibilities to some extent you know so i don't even necessarily look for i don't look at any two guard com- like comparison honestly i think you just get a guy who could play defense and shoot and i think that's just the archetype that a lot of teams look for on the wing you have two creators at two different positions usually not both a guard one's going to be a wing or a big and for some teams it's a wing and a big like you know you look at minnesota i wouldn't count to the edwards a, a point guard but he still handles a lot of their play creation but just somebody who can shoot and defend, you know, I think in any modern offense, you just want guys that can do that. And it's certainly around K, like you want as many guys similar to Fontecchio as you can get. Yeah. So this is from Teeks on Twitter. I, I like the question. I, I want to be like true. Like I still think Jay Ivey can work. I know a lot of people don't agree with that. I get it. But if the role is a high volume three point shooter and then he has to be really good defensively, obviously that's not going to be Jay Ivey. So I get it. I agree with you that it is a guy that really spaces the floor. I actually think Zach Levine archetype Omari is a good fit next to Cade Cunningham. Not necessarily Zach Levine with the contract and the injury history and all of that stuff, but a high volume scorer, I do think makes sense next to Cade Cunningham. I don't think Cade wants to necessarily, I think he wants the ball and the control of the offense, but I don't think that necessarily means he always wants to be the big time scorer dropping 30, 40 points a game every single night. Now, does he want to do that? And, and all of that? Yes. And again, this is an outsider's pers- you know, perspective. I have no direct contact to Cade Cunningham or his people at all. That's just my perspective. So I think the ideal compliment is a guy who at the very least, like you said, Amari really spaces the floor, but I think an all around bucket getter next to him, whether it's the two or the three makes a lot of sense. And then obviously the defensive impact would be huge as well. Yeah, like you need shooting, you need defense, and you need shot creation. And I think it doesn't necessarily matter who checks those boxes. Usually get enough of those boxes checked, you know, to where you become proficient in both of those areas. So, yeah, absolutely. And from the piss of the soft season, I'm just trying to get as many 3 and D guys as I can get. Yeah, and Jared, we will. I have it marked. We have it starred for, for your question we will absolutely get there. So I'm going to go to this one. Wes just dropped it in the private chat. And Jay from Twitter says, Trey Young makes sense. Wes said that there's a Trey Young to Detroit rumor that dropped today. I, I don't know if there's, like, if that's just straight rumor. I will say this. I don't think that makes sense at all. Based off what we just saw Trey Young in Atlanta with DeJounte Murray, I would, with all due respect, Jay, I disagree that that's the, the fit that makes sense. Unless you tell me, Omari, that Cade Cunningham wants to play off ball way more than what we've seen through his first three seasons. Yeah, for sure. I think a lot of that speculation was just generated from the fact that the Hawks need to make that type of trade. Sure. Uh, between Trey and DeJounte Murray, it probably makes more sense to trade Trey. And the Pistons are just the natural landing spot, given that they just won 14 games and they have a lot of cap space to burn. So if you're making a trade this offseason, they're probably going to make a swing for probably that tier of player on that tier of salary. But with that, like, again, when it comes down to whoever the new pre- president is, so, you know, this not, there's no one in the org now, you know, who's going to have, like, that that final say, like, that would be the person that they end up hiring. But with that, I don't think anybody would look at this past season and decide, you know, what we need to get smaller <laughs> <laughs> and to take Ed Cunningham off the ball. Like, I don't think those are necessarily the takeaways from this past season, and I don't know if you invest that much money 
into a point guard when you have all these other deficiencies elsewhere. So I think it's more of a long shot, uh, but again, that's going to be a decision made by somebody who's not currently hired yet. So Big Dog Piston says yes on Murray. Like, that's another interesting one. I don't think it's as bad as fit as Trey Young. But again, we just saw DeJounte Murray not be quite as good with Trey Young as he was. Like, I think DeJounte Murray is going to want to go back to San Antonio where he can be the primary on-ball guy. Or I still think Brooklyn makes a lot of sense for him. So Mark says Trey plus Cade could work like Kyrie and Luka. Like, yeah, if 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 Trey's at the point of his career where he's willing to play like what Kyrie does off as Luka. Yeah. yeah, like if you tell me that, maybe I haven't watched enough Trey Young or maybe people know, like I don't think Trey Young's at the point in his career where he's willing to take that back seat off the ball the way Kyrie does. The other thing is Kyrie's way better defensively than Trey Trey is, right? Yeah. Like, I, like I was just going to say like just overall, like Kyrie and Luka are better than Trey and Kate are now. Like it's like, it could work that way, but probably not as well. Like me and Bryce could be like Kyrie and Luca, but we, we probably wouldn't do it as well. You Which know, one of us is Luca? You're Luca. Okay. Like, yeah, there I'm Kyrie go. in that scenario. You're right, six six. Like I like I like I, like I have to give that to I, you. I, I listen. I just wanted to make sure. Yeah. Like I just I just want listen. Like no, I, I have not. I have, my game is more like who who is my game resemble on that team? Maxi Kleba. That's probably like the closest. Like who, Maxi Kleba. I was gonna give you. I was gonna give you Tim Hardaway. Oh no, he's got way more juice than I had. In 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 what way? Like as a shooter? No, like no, I I could shoot it, but like Tim, does, like he can get his own shot and stuff. I like, was trying to offend you, by the way. You were like a shooter, no, absolutely not. No, trying to think not. like who's the best floor spacer yeah. on that floor on that team that can't actually dribble. Like that's what I need. Who 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 can shoot the ball but not dribble? That like that's what Josh I need. Josh Green, baby. Yeah, I don't but know Josh, but, but Josh Green can defend. Make it okay, okay, it's something. Uh, shout out to Astra, uh, who just hopped in the uh, chat. Astra, the trainer. All right. Cause say what's up. Hi. Oh, all right. Now uh, go, what's up? Go play. When are we going to bring him up for an episode, Bryce? All he wants right now what? is candy open. So that's why he came to say what's up. Uh, what kind of candy is it? What is that? Oh, it's a toy. Okay. Can you go oh, play? It's a toy. All right. So, yes. Shout out, Ashton, for coming in. You're getting the peek behind. L- listen. This is what's cool about being 120 episodes in, Omari. Like we're we're letting some of the like rigidness of what we do go a little bit, and we're we're having a little more fun with these things. So no doubt. All right, let's go to another one. Teeks will come back to it. I don't want to go, even though I do like some of your questions. Dax hoops again. Do you feel like there's a certain direction the Pistons have, or is the future of the franchise going to be given directly to the new person? So I, I think that's it. Like. I feel like we've touched on this quite a bit, Omari, but maybe you can emphasize a point here in terms of, do you think this person comes in and and really it's like whatever? And and to be fair, that direction could be, have some overlap with what the current members of the organization have as well, I guess. Yeah. I mean, at the end of the the day, the president's going to have to present a plan that, you know, ownership believes in, right? My dad says no to trade. You know, I also said no to trade. Yeah. (laughs) But you have to present a plan that, the team could get behind, right? Like you have to get present a plan that, you know, Tom, he hears, he's like, yeah, this is the person who's going to lead us back. So I guess there's probably some level of approval there, but then the the trick after that is to continue to have that trust, right? Even if they go in a direction you may not inherently believe in, like that's the person making the judgment call. So I think that's when, you know, it, it really shows, right? All right. So Jared, we'll get to your question here. He says, well, the new president realized Isaiah Stewart is a five. I've been thinking about this a lot, Omari, and here's why. So on Twitter today, I put out, do you think Alex Saar is a better prospect than what Jalen Duran was when Jalen Duran came out? And I was actually shocked by the results because most of my followers are Pistons fans, even though I've dabbled in some other stuff, like that's still the majority. And actually, overwhelmingly, the the vote was Alex Saar. I was kind of surprised by that. But what I spent all morning doing, Omari, and I sent some of these to Wes was, how could this work together without just saying like, hey, you have to get rid of Jalen Duran if you draft Alex Sar? And what I found is like, you can actually only have to play them like 12 minutes together on in, in a game, still get them 30 minutes a night, which Duran didn't even play 30 minutes a night this year. Sar is going to be 19 years old, coming off a year where he played like 20 minutes a night in a professional league. So maybe not even have to be that much. And like, you have to be careful who else is on the floor when they are on the floor together and all that. Long-winded way of saying what I found though is I couldn't find minutes for Isaiah Stewart in that scenario. So like that's where it's like 
unless Stu could play the four, which I'm kind of out on, now there's no minutes at the five. So I, I think this will be interesting. Where do you what, what's your feel on Isaiah Stewart in terms of the four or five and maybe even the organization's feel on kind of what his position is? I still see Isaiah, I think, as a hybrid between both. And a lot of that just comes down to matchups, right? Like, I think against Milwaukee, you probably want to play him at the four because that's like your best matchup against uh, Yadis. You know, there are some teams where you probably feel better about about the five because you're not going against a team that has a, lo- a lot of size. So, you know, I don't think you can really pigeon him in, in, into either. I think I just see him as a big, you know, I think having a guy that, that just shot 38% from three, like not on the super high volume, but that does open up some positional uh, flexibility. So it's just like having that size and shooting and putting somebody next to him uh, who probably gives you a bit more size, right? Because again, like he's going to be another size five in some lineups and you probably don't want him single-handedly holding on to play against Rick Lopez and Giannis. So I'm still kind of in between on that. Like I thought I saw some stuff last season that like does make me buy into his upside as a four a bit more. It's like, you've got the shooting. So is it just to handle next and, like, again, like you're talking about somebody like retooling their game step by step, which is just a difficult process for anybody. But, you know, like along with that, it is tough because in this draft, you, know, you have a guy like Alex Starr at the, the top. If you're just looking at pure tools upside, he's probably number one pick for a lot of teams. Right. And so you have to evaluate, well, do we think Jalen Durant can make the necessary leaps on defense? Like, you know, if you can Stu and Starr play together, probably can Durant and Starr play together. One of those guys has to be able to shoot. So when I look at, at it that way, just from a, Positional fit standpoint, I think Stu gives you a little bit more of that. Yeah, so YouTube user says, Stu and Sar work together, in my opinion. Who cares which is a four or five? Uh, yeah. Entire, like, I agree. Here's the thing, though. If your three-man big lineup is Stu, Sar, and Durin, well, what are you doing with the Sar Thompson? Because now if the Sar Thompson is your three in some of those lineups, now your shooting lineup, like, you have no floor spacing. And again, as much as I like Jay Ivey, then where does Jay Ivey fit into that? So, like, mm-hmm. that's where I found myself going... I don't think you can keep all of these guys. And that's why I got the reason I got down this rabbit hole is I'm doing a community mock draft with, with our guy, Richard Seaman at Mavs draft and sorry to spoil my pick, but I, I had number one and for the sake of conversation. And because I don't know who the number two prospect is for me right now, because Risa Shea's three point percentage has dipped a little bit over the last month. I mean, not a little bit, it's still at 40, but it's gone down from like 45, 46. I just took Alex Starr at one Omari. I was like, you know what? I think he's the best player. There's a world where him and Duran and Stu and like all of this could work together. Let's try it. And, and I think what I do like is, again, it, it opens up a couple paths. Now you can you could trade him for something. If Duran doesn't get better defensively, which he may, then you could trade Jalen Duran. You know, you Isaiah Stewart, as somebody mentioned, is a real good contract. Maybe you trade Stu or like it gives you different paths. But I still don't think I fully buy into the fit of all of that. And so that's a concern, but like, I didn't, that's why I got down that path. And then as I got down it, I was like, okay, who else? This is why I think somebody's going to get moved, Amari. If this roster is actually going to improve before next season, I think some of the seven, eight guys we feel like right now are prioritized by the organization probably get moved before next season. Yeah, because just the nature of having a lot of young guys is that uh, most often if you're drafting well, you can't pay everybody, right? So I guess sure. that's sort of the downside of it is that, you know, a lot of your ability to afford who you drafted just really comes down to how long it takes for players to develop if they develop at all. So, you know, I would just say just looking at it mathematically, you know, especially if you go out and spend money this summer, that's that's really going to tighten your ability to retain some of these other guys down the road. You know, Ivy and Duran are now a year away from being able to sign extensions, right? And then yeah. you have a star and Sasser coming up right after that. You got Fonteki who's going to get paid this summer. You're already looking at handing out significant amounts of money for a roster that like just won 14 games. You know, so again, you're in sort of this weird space where you need to spend to get better, but yet you still are in this mode where you don't want to sell on your young players too early, you know, because they are still cheap cost controlled assets right now and they're guys that you drafted, you invested in, you believe in, that's going to be a really delicate type of rope to walk. I think this entire offseason is just weighing whatever offers you get, figuring out who you can prioritize, who you can't, and then just making the best choice going both ways. So Jay from Twitter says, do you have a comp for Alex Sar? My comp would be Evan Mobley. And I, I don't love comps. I'm not the best at it at all. But he's kind of in that archetype, right? We're talking about these seven footers that are mobile, that are really impactful defensively. 
the reason he isn't Victor is because nobody's Victor. Like we saw that play out over the season. Like just nobody, the, the fact he's seven, five moves the way he does, shoots the ball the way he does, handles the ball, like all of that, like nobody's Victor. The reason he's not Chet is he doesn't shoot the way Chet did like coming out against like Chet is just further along as a floor spacer. So that's why I like to comp him to Mobley a little bit more because we've seen Mobley be super impactful defensively, but we've seen some offensive limitations with can he space the floor? And if he can't space the floor, then can he play with another big like Jared Allen or does it bog down the offense and those type of things? So I do think that Evan Mobley is probably the right kind of idea of a player in terms of what you want to look at with Alex Saar. So, I mean, yeah, so yeah, like you, Chet is a victor and Chet is way better than Saar. I would agree with that. Like I do think Chet, but I mean, I think that kind of speaks to this draft in the sense that like there's not like it, it almost makes it awful that we're coming off the Victor draft that then we're coming into this draft where at the top Amari there's just there's nothing crazy and then if Sar doesn't fit like Risa Shea's interesting Buzelis is interesting like where do you go with these wings you know like I think Dalton Connect is an awesome fit are you taking Dalton Connect at number one like I don't think that's something you do you know what I mean Yeah no it's weird because if you're looking at the players who just fit the exact mode of what you need. Like, Sar and Risa Shea fit that boat, but again, you're now getting into the range where you're overlapping positions you've already addressed in the past. And I think the top of this draft, if you're looking at the best prospects, a lot of them are are bigs. Like, I think Donovan Kling is probably a top five or top six pick He's, he's really risen, like, yeah. Yeah, I mean, he's he's really, really good. Like, I feel like him and Reed Shepard, I said to somebody the other day, like him and Reed Shepard to be are the only two guys in this draft I feel very, very certain are above average NBA players. I don't know if they're stars, but I feel pretty good about them being able to step in and be pretty effective from day one. But neither of those guys are probably number one picks. You know, maybe you look at them at four or five, but uh, it's just interesting, you know, because even with Reed, you've invested a lot into the guard position as well. You don't really have those three and D types that you really need in this class. So hoops, comics, et cetera, ends up the Grizzlies are looking for a traditional big play with Triple J. He brings up Santi Aldama plus for Beef Stew. I think I would rather want to pick apart the Grizzlies wings. Maybe go find the wing that, that makes sense there. But uh, interesting, like uh, maybe B. Stu makes sense in Memphis in terms of just being that kind of quote unquote enforcer off of Jaron Jackson Jr. Brings up Stefan Castle. Start like, yeah, I mean, Stefan Castle has some some issues. Like he's an unwilling shooter right now. Like in the national championship game or maybe the final, he turned down a shot and traveled because he didn't want to shoot it. And so I don't think he's a good fit at all. As he says, Ejecto Cito does say that. It's just, you know, even the thing is, Omari, even Reed Shepard. And Reed Shepard shot over 50% from three. And it makes a lot of sense, right? Putting him on this team. I have some real questions about Reed Shepard staying in front on the ball in the NBA. Like, can he actually guard the other team's best perimeter player? And even if he can, he's like 6'1", 6'2". So at what point is he limited just based on height? Like, we've seen this with Marcus Sasser. I thought Marcus Sasser was a really good defender coming out of Houston. He gets beat sometimes just because he's only 6'1", or 6'2". So, you know, like, that's even a thing with Reed Shepard there. So the draft is going to be fascinating. And I wish there was just a guy that you like, I wish Jacoby Walter would have had a better season because I think he would be a guy that Pistons fans would love, but he just didn't shoot it as well. He didn't defend as well as what a lot of people thought. And I think the easy answer, Amari, is trade back, but you got to find somebody that wants to trade up if you're going to do that. Yeah. And honestly, I still think there's a great chance that they trade out altogether just sure. because that player that they kind of need in this draft isn't there, right? Like you could take a shot at somebody and that player may end up becoming somebody in two or three years, but it's already been two or three years. It's been four years, right? Like how many years can you spend, you know, just taking shots on draft picks so that strategy hasn't worked out for you yet. So I mean that, like that top five pick along with their cap space, like I think that's, if you include a young, like, you know, another asset as well, that could be enough to get you, you know, probably a player who could step in right now and help you win games. And, you know, I think that's probably closer to what, they would like to desire to do. Of course, you have to hire a president and everything else, but the team's been bad for a long time and it's just hard for me to see them coming into this offseason prioritizing more youth. But, you know, I would think they would, they would want to get older and find those complimentary pieces next to Kate. 
yeah, YouTube user said we need the Grimes archetype next to Cade, in my opinion. Like that, that would be awesome. Yeah. Uh, you know, just obviously not the version of Quentin Grimes we got to see for six games. I know he's battling an injury and all that. And I'll just say you have Cade, Ivy, Duran, Asar, Sasser, Stu, Grimes, and Tech. Those are eight guys who you've invested some sort of assets into. I just, I don't think all eight of those guys are going to be in the rotation to start next year, let alone all eight of them being on the roster. I don't know who gets moved. I don't know how it shakes out, but I'd be surprised if all eight of them are. All right, we're going to go to a short break. When we come back, same thing, Amari. Take this where you want to go in terms of any of the questions there in the chat, stuff from interviews yesterday or anything else. All right, we are back with segment three, and we're going to get to the, it's an inherently bad side of a lot of cooks, yes. because sometimes too many cooks in the kitchen is said to be a negative, but then you can spin it to a positive to another voice in the room uh, from Kian, which is a good question. Yeah, I like it. When you have a lot of cooks and it's working, it's a good thing. If you have a lot of cooks and it's not working, it's a bad thing. That's, I think it's as binary as that. It has not worked. So for the defenses, I makes it a problem. Yeah, and I think this is the point where they're at in this is, you got to start taking some chances and like people may be worried about bringing in somebody and giving them the the reins or whatever. But like you said, Omari, like it hasn't worked the way it's gone. And so either trade everybody and start over or again, I think you can thread, thread the needle here. And somebody asked like, what would be your pitch to free agents or something? Like it'd be Cade Cunningham. You get a chance to come play with Cade Cunningham, who I thought was really, I think it's been a little bit overlooked how good he was this year. I saw some stats in that final game, Amari, where I was like, dang, I think he had an even better season than what I what I realized. And there's money here and, and some other assets and all of that. So I think I like the idea of voices, but ultimately you have to have one decision maker. You cannot have multiple plans. Your coach, your GM, your owner, everybody ultimately has to have the same vision for the roster. Even if there are different ideas on how to get there, And I think hopefully this is what will happen with this new hire whenever it does happen is that that person will be able to take all of these ideas, put them together, throw out the bad ones, pick a path and go forward. No doubt. Like that's what you want. You want somebody who comes in with a clear vision. Uh, You could offer them all the tools you want to execute it. Uh, I think I saw a question earlier. I'm not sure if we started or not. That was like, what do you sell to a president of basketball operations? And that's what you have. Like I mentioned it, but you have all these tools you could just off right off the bat and say, here you go, get to work. Yeah, I agree. Uh, I want to go back. Wes said, maybe the new president of basketball operations decides to prioritize different youth instead of more. So that kind of speaks to what you were talking about, Omari, is maybe it's not adding any more youth. Maybe it's just picking a path. And this is kind of what we've talked about. I have my own thoughts, but I'm not going to hate if they say, hey, it's Cade and Asar. You know, Ku came on from Locked On Pistons and he talked about this, right? Cade and Asar. That's what should be moving forward. And then if it's Cade, Asar, Duran, you know, whatever it is, pick that path and move forward with it. And I will be okay with that. Like, I think it is a time in this rebuild and people from the outside think it's crazy. Like, I think a lot of people and maybe people, even Pistons fans, hey, let's let's tank for Cooper flag. Like, I don't agree with that. Like, I think it's time to start moving forward with what you have. You have Cade, pick what else it is around it and start moving forward. Do, do you feel the same way? Like, I love Cooper Flag, but I, I'm not taking a whole nother season to get Cooper Flag. No, no, I don't think you could throw away another season only to fall down to fourth or fifth again. Like, I don't know how many times you could spin that strategy and hope for a different outcome, even though it could work. But I don't know if they want to go down that, that path again. No, like, yeah. I, but Cooper Flag is good, though. Like, I don't know. Like, can, can fans still make one more season? Listen, Cooper Flag is really, really good. Don't get me wrong. Cooper Flag ain't Victor Wimanyama, though. Like, let's, like, you know what I mean? Like, it's not this yeah. just unbelievable, like, transcendent. Like, maybe he ends up being that. Maybe he goes to Duke and he is even better than what I think. But, like, that's a... Uh, and, and Brandon S. says, ultimately, I think it'd be a mistake to give up on Ivy and Duran and this Junker. Like, I, I don't I don't disagree. And maybe it's not even giving up on them. Maybe it's just like, hey, Jaden Ivy, you, you got to come off the bench or... We drafted Alex R, Jalen Duran. You have to come off the bench. Like the core four, quote unquote, doesn't all have to play together. They can be a part of this stuff moving forward. Though so I think it's just, it's interesting. We've had this a couple of times. So Ashton says, if the Suns lose first round, will they break up? 
Yeah, I know somebody brought up Devin Booker earlier. We talk about archetypes that fit next to Cade Cunningham. I mean, you will get Devin Booker this offseason. I think the whole fan base is, you know, jumping for joy. So, yeah, I mean, if you get Devin Booker, then I mean, that's an absolute uh, coup, right? Then they have the Suns have going all in, you know, on, on, win, on winning it this season. So, again, I think a lot of that just comes down to how far you, you get. But what I saw earlier today, they're going to have like the biggest luxury tax bill. So, you know, I don't know how long you can really feel that it kind of feels like it's like all or nothing this year. Ishbia is not messing around. Like he, he heard all the talk. He heard all the, the team specific podcasts talking about how they want their teams to overpay for Grayson Allen this summer. And he said, no, 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 we're going to go ahead and lock him up right now. They gave him, I think what it was four years, 70 million. But yeah, that's, that tax bill is going to be a lot of money. And I mean, what they, if they don't win first round, like what they go, they get knocked out in the first round by the Timberwolves. What do you do? You know, is everybody happy there? We know KD's been willing to move in the past. Is Booker ready for, you know, something new? So, I mean, I think that's the the pipe dream, right? That would just be incredible. I know Booker's a name that that's always come up. So we talked about the draft. Yeah, so th- this kind of goes hand in hand with it. In my opinion, to reach our full potential, the focus needs to shift to bringing in free agents starting this season to help build our young core. That allows money to get his guys no excuses after. I have the same vibe on Monty Williams. And again, like you said, maybe the new guy comes in and has a different perspective. I would give Monty Williams one year of a roster that I think he wants to coach and fits what he wants. And that's probably going to go through some free agents or trades or whatever, not necessarily just more young players. Yeah, no doubt. I look at it as uh, free agency and the trade market as well. And there's always a lot of the emphasis put on free agency. But when you look at the types of moves that really swing franchises like the Pistons, more often than not, they tend to be trades now. So I still see that as a pretty likely outcome. But no, you don't look at a roster that was too young, inexperienced, struggled with turnovers, you know, this and that, and then say, we need to get younger. Uh, so I absolutely think they're going to try to add some experience and some leadership and of course, just some talent to the locker room this offseason. So Ashton brings up Mikel Bridges, and we also had that from Big Dog Pistons. What do you think it would take to get Mikel Bridges? Do we have it? I mean, what the reports were, what were they, Wes? Jalen Green and multiple first round picks that were the Nets initial ones. And so like, I think if you're Detroit to actually get Mikel Bridges, you're probably talking one of the young guys this year's pick and a future does that that does that get close maybe that probably gets close i look at it from the net standpoint of michael fits every team like every team wants oh, a guy like oh, that yeah, absolutely and except in brooklyn where they don't have a primary guy like that's yeah. the one place he doesn't fit right now is cuz that's why cam thomas has to do everything playing yeah. him off cade he's in a better scenario and it's not hard to acquire like solid bar handlers in the league. Like I'm not sure which direction Brooklyn will go, but I will say, like, there's no iteration of a team that like Michael where Michael Bridges loses his value across the league. So if you don't like the offers you have now, there's no real reason to uh, come off of that deal to be like it has to be a team just offer or something where it's like this could absolutely jumpstart our rebuild, you know, when you look at similar trades that, you know, like the, the, the Aaron Gordon trade, for example, like those types of trades where teams got some really important assets back, you know, what could the Pistons offer that could reach that, that tier? Like you're probably looking at uh, this year's pick, a feature pick and a young player at minimum. But with that, you know, are the Pistons in a position where you could give up future picks, you know, for role players, right? You know, like it may be a scenario where, like neither team can really get that deal across the finish line because they just both need what they're offering. Yeah. I mean, I just want like, would they, would they see value in Jaden Ivey, Alex Saar and a future pick from the Pistons? Like, I, I, I don't know. And then if you're the Pistons, are you giving up all that? Like, I mean, to bring in Mikel Bridges, which is exactly what you need around Cade Cunningham and fits with everybody else you have. I, I don't know. Mikel Bridges is very interesting. Uh, he would obviously be awesome. But if Mikel Bridges is truly on the block, like this is where do the Pistons have enough probably really comes into the play is if Mikel Bridges is actually on the trading block, there's other teams that probably are going to be able to outbid them. And that's where it really becomes an issue. So Mark asks, any concrete free agency moves y'all are entertaining? I mean, Grayson Allen was a guy that I was kind of interested in. 
I don't know if Malik Monk makes sense or not, but I'll tell you I love Malik Monk and his game. The thing is, and this is why I said what I did before the break, Amari, like you bring in Malik Monk, well, do you need Monk plus Grimes plus Ivy? So who gets moved? What shakes out there? The problem is there's not a lot of guys at that four position, three position that I love whenever I look through this the other day. So are there any names that really stand out to you as you kind of look through? You know, I just go to Spotrack every once in a while, look through free agents and kind of see if there's any names that pop. Yeah, I mean, it's not a super inspiring free agency class. Like, again, like Grayson Allen was a guy who potentially made sense, but just more often than not, you have to trade for those guys more now. Like, I think Tobias Harris is like the obvious one. Uh, he's been here before. He gives you exactly what you need. Could rebound, like, could really, really shoot and score the ball. Like, you could put fill him at, at the three or four. I think it feel pretty good. Beyond that, like, I'm, I'm really am more intrigued by the trade market and which teams end up having to come off of some of these contracts. Yeah, a, a name that like just as a backup guy, you know, like Obi Toppin shot over 40% from three with the Pacers this year. But like, I'm not sure that's going to move the needle for people. You know what I mean? So I, I just don't think that needle moving player is there in free agency unless there's a trade that is made and then you fill in a hole when, you know, you trade, you know, some spot or whatever. So this is interesting from YouTube user. I'll frame it a little bit different, but is it hard to be a reporter some days, Amari? I mean, you know, the, the, the players organization always trying to keep things positive and, and everything like that. You know, like how is it to balance everything as a reporter of a team that's really struggling, trying to stay positive, trying to report what they're saying, trying to keep things real, all of that. Like your job isn't easy in general, let alone the team that's really struggling the way the Pistons have this year. Yeah. I mean, honestly, it didn't really become an issue until like late in the season with a lot of a lot of the guys who held the most intrigue as far as the direction of the, of the franchise were shut down with injury, you know, because like guys are going to talk about that as far as the actual season. But the reality is that most of the stories are right are not. Here's how players feel about the, the season. Like they may say, hey, like spirits are still high. We had a great shoot around this and that. And they say that a lot, but I'm not like I may tweet it, you know, but I'm not like writing, writing a story off of it. Because usually I'm writing about stuff that's more, you know, specific than that, whether it's, you know, about a player specifically or something off the game or draft related or offseason related or whatever else. So, like, honestly, it doesn't really bother me because, like, a lot of times that's just not necessarily, like, those quotes are not quotes I'm using for anything in particular anyway. And you also just know that when it comes to being in the middle of a bad season that there's going to be anything really compelling to say about the actual quality of basketball because, you know, the uh, team is going through something. So I can imagine it being more annoying for a fan and probably me as a reporter where I'll say a lot, a lot of my questions are probably not like going to produce those answers specifically, if that makes sense. All right. Kean asked an interesting, I don't know how this new CBA works with the second aprons, but the Pistons could have suitors or have teams compete with in dumping bad contracts and restart. I think what we could see this offseason is not the Joe Harris contract dumps, Omari. I think we could see like good player contract like we talked about like they're not dumping Devin Booker but that's a team who they could say like we're way too expensive and so we got to get off some of this contract the the prime example of this is the Minnesota Timberwolves and like the Minnesota Timberwolves something crazy have only like paid 25 million dollars in luxury tax in their history and they're set up to pay something crazy this offseason if they keep all of these guys so you know do they move towns what the Pistons want towns. Do they move Nas Reed? Like who I think would be awesome, but I, I just really like Nas Reed. I think he's an awesome basketball player. You know, somebody brought up Andrew Wiggins. The Warriors could find themselves in this position as again. So, you know, Wiggins, maybe people still look at that as a negative contract, but like, and it is because it's so long and all of that, but I don't think it's the Joe Harris, like there's 20, $30 million and this guy can't play at all. I think there's going to be some of those contracts traded where this guy could actually come in and contribute to your team. Yeah, no doubt. Like, you don't necessarily want to do what you did last season where you're essentially taking on salary dumps in exchange for some, like, for some draft capital, right? Like, to be, if you're, like, taking on a salary dump, you need, like, some real draft capital, whether that's a really good first or something similar, especially at this point in the rebuild where you're coming off of this type of season. You know, like, you need to move the needle forward in sub capacity. You know, so with that, I would say, like, Carl Anthony Towns, like, I think that's a name you look at if you know for a fact that you're probably not going to want to pay that luxury tax bill uh, this time next season. Like, is he a fit with the Pistons? Like, I don't necessarily know that, but 
as the playoffs continue, we're going to see, you know, teams probably reconsider their priorities just based on where they are contract wise. Right. So, you know, I think that is a picture that's going to continue to evolve over the next few weeks. Yeah, I mean, that's a big part of it is you got to make sure you keep this flexibility. You don't want to have the money this summer, then all of a sudden it's just all of that gone right away. Just a couple real quick ones. Raphael says Johnny Furphy. I don't think Johnny Furphy is going to be in the Pistons range. Like you're not drafting him in the lottery, in my opinion, but he's if he stays in, you know, you'd have to trade back into the first or the very top into the second. Now, honestly, if Furphy's not going to be a first round pick, I wonder if he stays in the class. Jonathan Schwartz says, how about Ben Simmons plus some first? You know, Simmons isn't expiring now. Like, I, I just, I don't know with that one. And then Woosh says, how realistic is Larry Markin as a target? Everything Probably I've heard very. and understand, yeah, is that like, that's yeah. just not something that's actually going to happen as much as that's a, a great fit. And it is, you know, it makes sense to talk about. Yeah. Like there are teams that would offer way more than what Detroit yeah. can offer at the end of the day. Yeah, I agree with that. So, all right, Omari, this was fun. It was always, it makes me a little nervous when the outline's not quite as like, hey, we're going to this and then this and then this. Just kind of my OCD kicks in there. I had a few other things. I had something else I was going to ask you about a Twitter poll I put out the other day, but we can save that for the offseason. Just some areas of improvement for this team moving forward. But a lot of fun. We will be back sometime next week. And truly, guys, like I know most of this was all about the offseason, but... We'll really be diving into the offseason the rest of the way. How can this team move forward? How can they get better? Maybe we'll have some news, maybe not. And definitely some draft content as we get closer and closer to that. So thanks, Dax Hoops. Thank you to everybody who tuned in live, everybody watching after the fact. If you haven't, hit the like button, subscribe. All of those things really help us grow. And then over on Apple, Spotify, leave a rating and a review. Again, we just... Help us get out there to any Pistons fans who aren't aren't listening or, or maybe when next season comes around, we'll start listening. So we appreciate you, Wes. Thank you, Amari. Take it away, my guy. No doubt. Finally in off-season mode. So lots of great stuff coming up. Big thanks to all of you for tuning in. Big thanks to our audio producer, Robin Chan, our editor-in-chief, Deco Avery Nichols, our executive producer, Ajadette Delgado, and our sports editor, Kirkley Crawford. And then big shout-out to Wes, as always. And we'll talk to you all next week. 